أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما نافعا اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to the Reflections on the Risale-i Nur by Bedi-Uzzaman Said Nursi podcast series. This is Mustafa Tuna. You can listen to the episodes of this series wherever you listen to your podcasts or at the website www.reflections-rn.org. In this episode, inshallah, we will continue reading the 10th word. The tenth word is about the verity of bodily resurrection and the hereafter. It is most likely the first treatise that Ustad Nursi wrote that became a part of the risale i Nur collection, the collection of the Epistles of Light. It is a lengthy treatise and it has three main parts. The first part is a metaphor, a story which we read through. It is about two friends who find themselves in a paradise-like place and everything is in perfect order. But there are some abusers in this place that don't follow order. They seem to be the exception, but they are there. One of the friends thinks that this place has no owner. The order that appears to be in place is just happen chance. And anyone who abuses, who go walks into others' houses, takes things from others who exploits others and so on and so forth will get a free pass and therefore he wants to be one of them he wants to do that too and the other one says no look carefully there is perfect order here there is beauty there is justice here and this cannot be by itself there must be an owner of these places and also look nobody who comes here stays here everybody is moving on to another realm from here that means we will go there too and if the owner of these places has that perfect justice perfect order etc and we do not see what becomes his justice here there must be another place where the justice is going to be established. There must be a seat of power where he is going to take all of us into account. So more carefully, pay attention to what you are doing. Follow your order. Go submit. And the other friend resists for a while, but in the end he says, okay, I, I am accepting what you are saying because the smarter friend provides, the truthful friend provides many, many proofs for the existence of that hereafter, that, that realm in the unseen but certain future. But this still is a metaphor. We read through all of that material within the story, within the metaphor, and now we are slowly moving to the reality that the metaphor and many of the themes in the metaphor were pointing to. But before we move on to that reality, Ustad Nursi provides us with an introduction too. And in this introduction, inshallah, we are reading the four indications of the introduction, which are brief but very powerful proofs for what we know, how we know it, why we should know, and what befalls on us once we know about the reality of the cosmos, of the realm that we found ourselves in as human beings. Today we will read the second indication, which is primarily about the about prophethood and the messengership of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Bismillah. İkinci işaret. The second indication. Hikayede bir yaveri ekremden bahsedilmiş ve denilmiş ki, Kör olmayan herkes onun nişanlarını görmekle anlar ki o zat padişahın emriyle hareket eder ve onun has bendesidir. In this story, in the metaphorical story that we read through in the past several weeks, there is the mention or, or there was the mention of an aide de camp, an honorable, honored aide de camp. And it was said there that 
Anyone who is not blind would understand upon seeing his decorations that he is moving upon the command of a sultan, of a monarch, and he is a special, special servant of that monarch. So imagine that you um, saw a person, an officer who comes to you and his chest is full of these decorations and you know the meanings of these decorations too. And they all point out that this person is a special servant of the king. You know from those decorations. The Prophet ﷺ had all those decorations in his miracles, in his character, in the message that he brought and so on and so forth. We will talk about those now. We will talk about those decorations. They all point out that he is a special servant and an and aide the comp of the monarch. He is not anybody. He is not anybody. He has a mission. İşte o yaver Ekrem, Resul-i Ekrem'dir. Aleyhissalatu vesselam. So that aide the comp, that honorable, honored aide the comp is the honorable messenger sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem peace and blessings be upon him evet şöyle müzeyyen bir kainatın öyle mukaddes bir saniine böyle bir resul-i ekrem ışık şemse lüzumu derecesinde elzemdir Üstad Nursi here will say that something is utterly necessary necessary to the maximum amount of what necessary can mean what is it? What is so necessary? It is the metaphor he gives is that the way light is necessary for the sun. Something is necessary to that degree. Now let's try to understand the metaphor f first. Light is necessary for the sun. What does that mean? Can we imagine the sun without light? Now, if we want to be uh, smart Alex, perhaps we could, but we are talking about common sense here. We are talking about what the intellect entails. We are talking within the realm of reason and reasonability. The sun, by definition, is an object that emits light. That is how we recognize it. That's how we witnessed it. And therefore, that's how we recognize it. Sun entails light. The way that light is necessary to the sun, such a an honored messenger is necessary for the holy artful maker of a cosmos that is so beautifully embellished and adorned and ornamented why the cosmos that we look around remember in this story these friends found themselves in a paradise like place that is their uh, the the source of their information the source of their knowledge about what they are seeing and what that points to so we look around the cosmos that we are living in and we see that it is beautifully em embellished adorned ornamented now first of all this indicates a purpose if there is such ornamentation and that ornamentation is so orderly so balanced it cannot be that cannot be happen chance that cannot happen by itself there is intent that we can see behind it so if somebody adorned it beautified it in this way that means that this person wants it to be seen if this person wants it to be seen he is going to find or create in this case beholders spectators who will look and appreciate that beauty but this is so big, so complicated, and so lofty that the spectators on their own will not be able to understand and appreciate the beauty in all its detail and entirety and with all the meanings that are attributed to it. That's the other aspect of this. It is not only adorned, but all that adornment, all that ornamentation, all that embroidery is also meaningful, orderly and meaningful. Then the creator artful maker of this cosmos this this work of art will also send somebody a guide who is going to help us understand the aspects of its beauty 
So this is the foundational notion of what we are going to be reading about in this second indication. This is where we start. Now one may say, so how do we know that the possessor of beauty wants to show the beauty, the, the artful creator, uh, someone who creates beauty wants to show it? We know from ourselves. We know from ourselves in our innate nature as human beings that um, maybe instinct might be the word to use here for us, for human beings that instinct exists. If you think of a four-year-old child who draws a beautiful picture, a house, the sun, the hills in the background, the stream flowing by the house and animals, etc. A whole thing. It, it, it turns out to be really beautiful and appealing. What will he do or she do? He will take the, the piece of paper with the the, with the painting and run to his mother or run to his father and say, Mama, Mama, Father, look what I did. And he will want the mother or father to appreciate it. And if, let's say, there are others living there, maybe guests in the house, if the father or mother takes the picture and shows it to the guests and says, look what he drew. And everybody says, wow, mashallah, so beautiful. The child will be happy. Now, this is not just a human instinct that just happens to be there. All of these instincts, all of these inclinations, all of these qualities, character traits, etc. that we have in our innate nature are there in order to help us understand our Lord. This is a deep and big issue. Inshallah, we will read about it toward the end of the book, The, the Words. Uh, in more detail, but this much should be sufficient for now. It is there for us to be able to recognize our Lord, not to measure our Lord. We have this instinct, we have this inclination. From that, we understand that any artful, any, any creator of art wants to show it. And that's where we stop. We don't say that, okay, this is how it is for God. We understood God. No, we, we don't understand God. The, God is beyond our comprehension, but we understand what is going on here around us in the cosmos that we live in by the with through the help of this notion. We look around and it is adorned, so we understand why it is adorned, what befalls on us. What befalls us that we behold it and we appreciate it. And that's that, that's about it. We appreciate it as the artful creation of an artful maker a majestic artful maker Sani Izul Jalal so we understand this notion from ourselves and then this is corroborated with other information that we get from other sources such as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the book the Quran etc so the one part of it is that we have this in us and we we observe it around us and the other part is that there is someone who says that he got a message from the creator of these places and that message corroborates what we observed. Therefore, we can be sure that there is certain information here in our hands that this is the case because the two main sources, the two major sources of knowledge that we are to look at are corroborating one another. Evet, şöyle müzeyyen bir kainatın öyle mukaddes bir saniyine böyle bir Resul-i Ekrem ışık şemse lüzumu derecesinde elzemdir. Yes, in the way that light is necessary to the sun, such an honored messenger is necessary for the, the holy artful maker of such an adorned, embellished, beautiful cosmos. Çünkü nasıl güneş ziya vermek sizin mümkün değildir, öyle de uluhiyet de peygamberleri göndermekle kendini göstermek sizin mümkün değildir. Because in the way that sun is not possible to be, to, to exist without emitting radiance, radiant light, ziya is the word, ziya in Turkish or ziya in Arabic is the word that's being used here. And I, we might have mentioned this before. There are two main words that correspond to light in Turkish and Arabic that Ustad Nursi uses. And he uses ziya or ziya in Turkish in reference to light that is 
emitting from its source and he uses nur with reference to light that reflects on or refracts through things and makes things visible and we can think of it as illumination we can use light for both the distinction is not always very clear but at times it is clear and it is important to pay attention to it because sometimes it can lead us to some nuances that may otherwise not be understandable so the way that sun is not possible without emitting radiance in the same way divinity is not possible without sending prophets in order to show itself or divinity is not possible without showing itself by sending prophets divinity uluhiyet ilah the divine god god god is worshipped in order to be worshipped the worshippers need to know the worshipped God. And for the worshippers to know God, they need to be able to, to have information to know God. They need to be guided. So the, the way sun cannot be thought of without emitting radiance, divinity cannot be thought of without sending prophets who are going to show the divine being. And from here on, Ustad Nursi will provide us several of those decorations, uh, proofs, evidences, indications that, that necessitate the divine being in our understanding. Again, this is very important. We are not talking about the essence of God. Whatever we say here, we are not trying to limit God. What we are talking about is what makes sense based on the information that we have by observing the cosmos around us by using the tools that are put in our innate nature and observing ourselves and by by using the information that we get from revelation these are the three major sources of knowledge for us what makes sense based on this information so Ustad Nursi will here on provide indications, proofs, evidences for the necessity of prophethood. Hem hiç mümkün olur mu ki nihayet kemalde olan bir cemal, gösterici ve tarif edici bir vasıta ile kendini göstermek istemesin. In the Arabic version of this part that, that, that will come, that was written before the Turkish part, the verb that Ustad Nursi tends to use, usually uses is require or entail but in turkish he put it in a in the form of a question and he says hiç mümkün olur mu ki would it at all be possible which then rhetorically means that it is not possible so we will keep using the same form would it at all be possible what we mean is it is not possible this is not an open-ended ended question this is a rhetorical question would it at all be possible that a beauty that is so utmostly perfect will not want or require a displayer a guide will not want to be want to show itself through the means of through the mediation of a displayer an explainer a describer and the answer to this because this is a rhetorical question is that yes a beauty that has such utmost perfection will demand that why because the beauty that we see around that that is incomparably uh that that's incomparable that's not comparable to the perfection of that beauty the beauty of the, the divine being wants it the four-year-old child when he has that picture painted he wants to show it then this is this is what is happening in this limited world in this limited scale that we live in then what about the beauty that has reached utmost perfection that all beauty that we see around or hear around that we sense around is nothing nothing but a small reflection a a partial reflection of that perfect beauty a partial manifestation of that perfect beauty so if this is what happens for the limited one what about the unlimited perfect one of course it too will want to show itself it too will require being displayed 
through the guidance of a displayer and an explainer, a describer. Hem mümkün olur mu ki gayet cemalde bir kemali sanat onun üzerine enzarı dikkati celbeden bir dellal vasıtasıyla teşhir istemesin. Again, would it at all be possible that a perfect art that is utmostly beautiful will not want to be displayed by means of an announcer, a crier that attracts the attention of sights on it. There are what what did we say at the beginning? This beauty will call for spectators, beholders. They will have sight, they will look, they will behold. Right? So the thing is all of this is scattered. Somebody needs to draw our attention to various aspects of the beauty. Some of the beauty is Perhaps some of the beauty is clear to everybody, even the lowliest creature, such as taste. Taste. Even the animals have taste buds and they have this appreciation of what they eat. When you put something that they like in front of them, they are going to eat it with a higher appetite. And that appetite is, in a sense, a kind of appreciation and also gratitude, expression of gratitude. But there are other kinds of beauty that may need our may need our attention to be drawn to. And this beauty, utmost beauty, has reached perfection of artistry, has reached perfection of artistry, and therefore it entails that there will be someone out there who is going to point point the fine aspects of the perfections of this artistry for us and say, look at that, look at that, look at that. There will be an announcer, a crier. Dallal is the word that is used in Turkish. Hem hiç mümkün olur mu ki bir rububiyet ammenin saltanatı külliyesi kesret ve cüz'iyat tabakatında vahdaniyet ve samedaniyetini zülcenaheyn bir mebus vasıtasıyla ilanını istemesin. Would it at all be possible that the general, universal, comprehensive, royal power of a general, all-encompassing lordship? Let's try to understand this first. This is the subject of our sentence, and this is going to be what entails, what, what demands or wants, wishes something. The all-encompassing, comprehensive royal power of a general all-encompassing lordship. The word that's used for lordship is rububiyya, and we had mentioned this before, coming from the word rab, rab, lord. Lord is, an, is a common translation, but there is no single word that perfectly matches this word in Arabic as it has come to be used in the Islamic texts. Or, or even the Quran. Rabb, caring master, caring master, nurturer. So it's not only master. It's not Lord the way, let's say, a landlord in the times when slavery was all, uh, everywhere. A landlord was a master over his slaves, and especially if this is a cruel landlord. No, that's not what we will be thinking about. We will be thinking about a nurturer. A mother is a rub over her baby. The mother possesses the baby. The baby belongs to the mother. So the mother in that sense is a master over the baby. But at the same time, the mother cares for the baby. The mother has concern for the baby. The mother has compassion for the baby. The mother takes care of the baby, provides the needs, fulfills the needs of the baby. When the baby is hungry, the mother gives the baby food, milk. When the baby is thirsty, the mother gives the, gives the baby liquid, milk again, or maybe water, maybe juice, something. When the baby is sick, the mother cares for the baby. And all of this is included in the word rab, rab. So without rububiyya, without that caring lordship, nothing, nothing in the universe, nothing in existence would exist. We would not be able to exist. 
If I was hungry this morning and I found food in the refrigerator and ate it and I was then full and satiated, if I was thirsty later in the day and I found pure beautiful water and I drank it and I was my, my thirst was quenched, if I was tired last night and I was able to lie down in a, in a on a bed and sleep be able to sleep all of this are provided to me by my Lord and I need to appreciate this I need to be grateful for this if the tree that's out in the in the yard is able to take water from the ground maybe extend its roots deep into the ground and even when it is hot and dry find water in the ground and pull that water up through its veins and take it to the leaves so that the leaves under the sun do not shrivel and die they are constantly being fed with water with a source of water so that they can preserve their freshness and this is a need for the tree and this is pro being provided for the tree that is the act of the lord the rub that is the lordship that we are seeing out there now the lordship is comprehensive the lordship is all and all encompassing the lordship is universal there is nothing nothing left out the stars let's say stars like the sun need hydrogen in order to continue their explosions and, and emit light and exist hydrogen is provided to them so their provision is there the apple worms in the apple are provided by the nutrition of the apple and that is in there nothing nothing is left out rububiya is over everything lordship the caring mastership the, the, the nurturing of the Lord is over everything and this then then leads to a universal general royal power because he is the one who provides everything at all times that is absolute power over everything if he did not provide anything for a single moment nothing would exist nothing would continue to exist from moment to moment if he did not bring them into existence and provided them with their needs and this is absolute power this is absolute royal power over everything so this is the subject of our sentence would it at all be possible that the general universal royal power of such a universal lordship would not want that his essential oneness and the that he is the eternally besought one would not be announced by a deputy with two wings in the layers of in the realms of multiplicity and particulars and of course this also needs to be explained a little uh, bit first of all let's start from the simpler easier one by a deputy with two wings that is a metaphorical explanation uh, a metaphorical expression that is used in arabic and has come into turkish two two wings means that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam here it is being used in reference to the messenger of god sallallahu alaihi wasallam it can be used for other people other phenomena too but here it is being used for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that he had two wings means that he was in touch with the creator and he was in touch with the creation from another point of view he so witnessed and was involved in the realm of the hereafter in the realm of meanings in the realm of uh, dominicality and the realm of command and these are in some of these are still technical uh, terms but all of them put together i hope um, everybody will understand something from this we'll have a, a sufficient notion about what we are talking about he was involved in that the the realm of singleness oneness the realm of oneness where everything looks to and is under the command of the one without any means and appearances without any screens without any veil and and he is also involved in this realm where everything is screened and veiled for the purpose of testing and the realm that we live in is the realm of 
multiplicity so this is the other notion that we need to explain in this sentence we are living in the realm of multiplicity here everything is taking place through matrices of causes and effects if we were to tie all of these together we would not be able to leave a single thing out that a speck of dust is floating in the air of the room where i am now is dependent on a galaxy 300 million light years away from here doing what it is doing in the end everything is connected to one another in one way or another but they are connected through a matrix of the amazing mind-boggling matrix of causes and effects there are causes and effects everywhere and this is the world of multiplicity the causes and effects the things that are involved in these causal relations are multitude they are multitude from the number of atoms or even subatomic sub particles to the stars and galaxies the things the items the phenomena that are involved in this matrix are multitude amazingly amazingly many many but at the same time they all look to one they all come from one they are all the product of the one and if, you, if they were taken together and squeezed the meaning that would come out of all of them together would point to nothing but the one the creator so the realm that we are witnessing here is the realm of multiplicity but then there is also the realm of command alam al amr is the word that is that is used in the, the in the terminology of islam based on the guidance of the quran and that's also the word that ustad nursi likes to use sometimes the word jabarut will also be used uh, for this that is the realm where the reality of all of this is completely apparent there is nothing but god's command there and then layer upon layer this this unfolds and becomes what we are witnessing here so this zuljana hain the two-winged deputy has access to the realm of the one to the divine to the divine being and he has access to he is in the realm of multiplicity and the realm of multiplicity is also the realm of particulars why particulars uh, we again we talked about this before Ustad Nursi talks about generals and particulars the generals that he is talking about can be explained perhaps with the example of let's say a pine tree a pine tree is a particular of the species of pine and the species of pine is the particular of the type of uh, trees and then when we think in an, in another respect the branch of each pine tree is a part of the pine tree so this is a longer discussion we are going to cut it short here because this should be sufficient to understand this sentence the realm of multiplicity and particulars is a realm in which you can witness things one by one in relation to one another but also distinct from one another but when you look at this this this this uh complex matrix of things in the cosmos what you should or we should see is that they are all they are all created by sustained by being taken care of by worshiping turning to supplicating uh, submitting their gratitude to the one the one god and he is the one and he was the one before anything else was created so oneness is in his essence we are talking about essential oneness and he is also the one that everything is in need of eternally be sought at all times by everything in that realm of multiplicity we witness his oneness in that realm of multiplicity and particulars we witness that he is the single eternally be sought one okay and why is that important because if we do not witness that our minds might be scattered and we may become polytheists 
we may start ascribing partners to God. And this may be a very subtle thing. We must have given this example before. I might think that there is one God. He is the one who is worthy of worship. I might recite the testimony of faith. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh, etc., etc. But when I get sick, I may go to the doctor, and the doctor may give me medicine. And without thinking about it, I might think that it is the medicine that is healing me. And there. I have fallen into a subtle, subtle polytheism. I saw power, intrinsic power in the medicine. I did not think, recognize, and, and certainly know that it is not the medicine, but it is God who heals. God may be healing me through the medicine. God may have put his healing in the medicine, but if I ascribe this to, medicine, to the medicine and forget about God, that is a manifestation of some subtle and dangerous polytheism. I ascribed a partner to God. I recognized God as God, but I ascribed a partner to him in this particular instance with regard to the, the quality of healing that I needed in order to feel more comfortable and, and be done with my sickness, my ailment. And we don't want that. We want to see his essential oneness and that he is the eternally besought one everywhere, in everything. And a royal power, a general universal royal power like this, who has lordship over everything, who is the caring master and nurturer of everything, will want the intellect entails what makes sense is that he will want his essential oneness and that he is eternally besought one to be recognized in in all realms in all these realms of multiplicity and particulars and for this to be recognized he is going to send a deputy who has access to him who can see the oneness clearly he, the, the multiplicity does not blur his vision, the clarity of his vision, and who can talk to the creators of the multiplicity. He knows them and he is able to interact with them. The divine being is going to send a deputy who can do this, and our minds should not accept otherwise. This is what common sense, this is what the intellect necessitates. Yani ozat ubudiyeti külliye cihetiyle kesret tabakatının dergahı ilahiye el ilahiye de elçisi olduğu gibi kurbiyet ve risalet cihetiyle dergahı ilahinin kesret tabakatına memurdur. That is the, the, the, the sentence the next sentence is an explanation of the previous one too. That is that person who the deputy with two wings is the deputy of the court of divinity in the realm of multiplicity from the point of view of his universal worshipful, worshipful slavehood. What does that mean? The Prophet, if you make this more concrete, I am hoping that it will be understood more easily. The Prophet وسلم, had universal worshipful slavehood. Worshipful slavehood is uh, the translation of the word arbudiyya. And ubudiyah is different from ibadah, which is worship. Ibadah is act. Ubudiyah is state. Worshipful statehood is the state that emerges, emerges from all the acts and states of a person before his Lord. The Prophet ﷺ had a universal worshipful slavehood. What does universal mean here? His worshipful slavehood his position before God was able to encompass, comprise, and represent the worshipful slavehood and the worships, of course, of everything in the creation before God. That is why he was selected. He was the elect and he was selected to be brought before God, to God's presence in his mi'araj, in, in the prophetic ascension. He was the created being that was chosen among 
all other created beings and taken all the way to a point beyond which even Jibril, Gabriel, could not go. He said, if I go beyond this point, I'm going to, to, to burn, I'm going to disappear. But the Prophet وسلم, his worshipful slavehood, his state, was so powerful, so universal, so encompassing that he was able to be, go beyond that. And what did he do there? He presented the greetings, the worship, the gratitude of everything in the creation to the Lord, to their Lord. So from the point of view of his worshipful slavehood, he is the deputy envoy of the realm of multiplicity in the divine court. And from the point of view of his closeness and messengership, he is the official of that divine court in the realm of multiplicity. Closeness and messengership. That is, he is the one who is closest to the Lord, closest to the royal power that we are talking about. He is the most decorated one. He is the one who is given most access to the divine court. And because of that closeness, he is also chosen as the messenger, messenger of the divine court among the realm of multiplicity. And we should also remember that although every prophet and messenger before him were sent to particular nations, communities, he was sent as a messenger, as a prophet and messenger to the entire creation, as a mercy to the entire creation. That is the Prophet sallallahu aleyhi ve sellem. Hem hiç mümkün olur mu ki nihayet derecede bir hüsnü zati sahibi cemalinin mehasinini ve hüsnünün letaifini aynelerde görmek ve göstermek istemesin. Now, would it at all be possible, again the same expression, what does the intellect call for? What makes sense? Would it at all be possible that the owner of an essential beauty of excellence that has reached the utmost degree will not want to see and show the beauties of his visible beauty and the subtleties of his beauty of excellence in mirrors. Um, this is a difficult sentence to translate because of the use of two words that are similar to Dhiya and Nur, uh, radiance and illumination with regard to the notion of light. Here the, the notion that we are talking about is beauty. And there are more than one words in Arabic that correspond to beauty and they, are, they have important nuances that cannot be conveyed perfectly perhaps that cannot be conveyed at all in the English language. These two words are husn and jamal. Husn, or let's start from jamal. Jamal, if you put it in a crude way, is a visible beauty, beauty that we cannot, uh, that, that we can sense with the senses that we have. Seeing, hearing, touching, smelling uh, beauty that is visible that is apparent right now that beauty may be an indication of inner beauty and therefore it may be related to inward uh, aspects of beauty too so it is not only apparent only external beauty no it is visible beauty but again, that's a crude translation that I'm making in order for us to be able to move on having understood the distinction between husn and Jamal to some extent. Husn, on the other hand, includes inward beauty and it also indicates excellence. A beauty that emerges from the excellence of a thing. And when we say excellence, that means inward and outward, visible and not visible, everything included. Having thought for a long time and not being able to come up with better words, I have chosen the phrase beauty of excellence and beauty in order to render these two words. Husn is beauty of excellence and Jaman is beauty. 
Sometimes when the distinction is not that important, I might be using just beauty for both. But when these two words are used in the same sentence together, we have to make the distinction so that we can actually understand what Ustad Nursi is talking about here. So, would it at all be possible that the possessor of essential beauty of excellence, so we are talking about God, of course, and he has husn, he has excellence, and that excellence is beautiful, and that beautiful excellence is not something that is attached to him no it is in his essence it is essential it was there it is there it will be there before during and after the creation of the entire creation before time and after time because time is created too it belongs to god's essence now the nature of that, obviously, we cannot understand because we cannot understand and comprehend God's essence. But we know that this is an essential quality. This is an essential aspect of God. But of course, here we are not talking directly about God. We are talking about logic here. A possessor of essential beauty that has reached the utmost degree. Is it at all possible that this person will not want to see and show the beauties, the beautiful aspects of his beauty, Jamal, visible beauty, and the subtleties of his beauty of excellence. Subtleties, because they are not as easily visible. You need to look and understand. You need to relate things uh, to one another. You need to, com to contemplate a bit, and you will understand. And when you understand, it's going to be amazing. These are subtleties. So, he will want to see and show the beauties, beautiful aspects of his, that visible Jamal, and the subtleties of his husn, where? On mirrors. On mirrors. That's what the intellect entails again. How do we know? We talked about this at the beginning. Yani, yani, bir habib rasul vasıtasıyla ki, hem habibdir, ubudiyetiyle kendini ona sevdirir, aynedarlık eder. Hem Rasuldür, onu mahlukatına sevdirir, cemali esmasını gösterir. Now, that was a logical statement. Now we are getting closer to the reality of that. That is, through the means of a beloved messenger. So we need a beloved messenger for this to happen, for the act of showing, seeing and showing to happen through the means of of a beloved messenger, such a beloved messenger that he is both beloved to that possessor of beauty and he also endears himself to that possessor of beauty through his worshipful slavehood. Why? Why is the endearment? Because as we said, that possessor of beauty will want to see and show. He will want to see it. Now, if you want to see your beauty on mirrors, would you not have an attraction toward the mirror that is the best among all others? That shows everything as is, that that is capable of showing your perfection to a perfect extent. We can perhaps think of this as digital photography. There was a time when three megapixels in, in photography was seen as a breakthrough three megapixels this is probably maybe about 20 years ago perhaps more three megapixels now i don't know to what extent they have gone but you can have probably hundreds hundreds of uh, megapixels or not even megapixels gigapixels several gigapixels of photography what that means is that per square centimeter you used to be able to let's say hypothetically you used to be able to put 100 dots and each dot being colored in a different way when they all came together it made a beautiful picture and this was a breakthrough and instead of those hundred dots that that the technology was able to put in a square centimeter or square inch now you can put a million dots what is going to show the perfection in the actual object that is being imaged of course, there was a reduction in the quality and therefore the perfection when we were using 100 dots in, uh, per square centimeter or per square inch. Now that we are using a million dots, 
it shows much better. Now imagine a photograph that can reflect the beauty and perfection of the actual image better than anything else to the utmost degree to the degree that a photograph can possibly be the best in the realm of possibility of course this is going to be the photograph that is going to be chosen among all others that was the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is the one who shows the perfection of the beauty and the subtleties of the beauty of excellence of the possessor of this beauty of excellence to the utmost degree. Therefore, therefore, he is beloved and he endears himself to the Lord through his worshipful slavehood. He is the one who has the best supplication. He is the one who has the best level of gratitude. He is the one who contemplates and comprehends the greatness, the majesty, the beauty, the, the, the mercy, the compassion, and also the, the uh, you know, majestic attributes, the, the overpowering, the, the power of, of the, the, the Lord, of God. And therefore, he serves as a mirror, the best mirror. And on the other hand, he is also a messenger, the master of the messengers. He is also a messenger who shows the beauty of the divine names to the creatures and makes the, the divine being, the possessor of those beautiful divine names, visible to them, to the humans, to the animals, to the inanimate beings, to the jinn, to the angels. He is a mercy to all realms. He is a mercy to the entire creation. And what does he show to them? He shows them the beauties of the divine names. Why? Because everything that is attractive to us and to anything in the creation Something that is not attractive to us may be attractive to something else in the creation. Therefore, there is nothing that does not have some aspect of beauty in the creation. Everything that is beautiful out there in the creation is a manifestation of God's beautiful names. That's the source. Anything that you think is beautiful and you are attracted to, when you look at that, think that this is but but a small partial minuscule limited deficient manifestation of the perfect beauty that he has and that perfection that perfection that beauty is manifest on everything in a sense being refracted from his divine names provision is beautiful when a baby lamb for instance is hungry and wants to suckle his mother needs that milk and reaches the the the other of his mother and starts to suckle just the appearance of that is beautiful but imagine the the joy the delight that this lamb is having by suckling that milk from his mother that is beautiful that is beautiful and that is a manifestation of at least at least the names the provider and the name rahim the compassionate one who is mercy is manifest on each thing one by one that lamb was individually chosen and given this blessing at that moment so all this beauty is but a refracted manifestation of his divine names and it is the messenger of god sallallahu alaihi wasallam who teaches this to us left to our own means we would not be able to recognize this know about this to the extent that we now are able to having read the quran having witnessed his life and that is that is one of the greatest sunnas let me talk about the sunnas of the prophet wasallam. he ate with his right hand and that is very important this is not to belittle those sunnas uh, prophetic practices of daily life uh, but when he walked into uh, the masjid he walked in stepped in with the right foot and if we are not doing this we should try to 
develop the consciousness that if I'm stepping into the masjid, I need to step in with the right food because the Prophet ﷺ did. If I'm eating food, I need to eat with the right hand because the Prophet ﷺ did. It is mentioned in some hadith that he ate 21 pieces of black raisin a day. So I'm going to eat 21 pieces of black raisin a day because the Prophet ﷺ did. I want to follow his model to the point, to the point. I don't care whether it is logical or not, whether it makes sense to my limited mind or not. If it, it appears not to make sense and the, and the narration is clear and sound, that's because my mind is not able to comprehend it yet. There is something, there is some wisdom in it. I am going to try to follow him to the point. Okay, how about this? How about looking at the sky? on a clear night, witnessing the moon, witnessing the stars, witnessing the beauty there, and, and, and, and saying, Oh Lord, you have not created this in vain, and trying to recognize, contemplate, that yes, he has not created it in vain, he has created it for a purpose, and the beauty of that, that I'm witnessing there is but a manifestation, but a limited and deficient manifestation of his absolute and, and, and, and infinite beauty. How about this contemplation? How about this reflection? That is sunnah. That is, that is a more foundational sunnah than eating with the right hand. And again, this is not to belittle eating with the right hand. If one does that, if, you, if one eats with the right hand, because the Prophet ﷺ did, one gets the ajr for it. But we should not focus on these practical aspects of the sunnah and forget about the more foundational, more essential ones. That's a trick of Satan. That is a trick of our lower souls. That is a sign of heedlessness, forgetfulness. That is a sign of falling away from the source. We want to be closer to the source. They're all important and it comes as a whole package. But in the package, there is the more foundational aspects of the sunnah that unfortunately are being forgotten, that unfortunately are being forgotten among the believers, including myself, including myself. So, inshallah, we will stop here and we will continue in our next reading of the 10th word from the next paragraph. And this this is one of the parts in the in the Risale in order that I love. It is, uh, it is about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It also it helps us understand the function, the position, the role of the Messenger of God. It is not only logical proofs, indications for the verity and necessity of prophethood and messengership. It is that, but it is also something that helps us understand what it is that the Prophet ﷺ was the Messenger of God. Alhamdulillah. سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وآخر الدواهم أن الحمد لله رب العالمين الفاتحة